Welcome to Smart Talk. My name is Edward Dodson. I'm a longtime member of the faculty of the Henry George School of Social Science. Uh, this is my second opportunity to host Smart Talk. I'm sure you'll find today's discussion both enlightening and interesting. The participants on this episode of Smart Talk are Marty Rowland and Daniel Bromley. Marty chairs the Education Committee of the Henry George School and is a member of the school's Board of Trustees. He earned his doctorate in urban studies at the University of New Orleans, the College of Urban and Public Affairs. Dr. Rowland has over 40 years experience in the fields of civil and environmental engineering, now with the New York City Parks Department. He is also a senior fellow with the Asset Leadership Network, a Washington, D.C.-based public policy think tank concerned about physical asset management. His work has enormous potential to provide decision makers with an objective analysis of the impact and costs of contemplated infrastructure projects. Daniel Bromley is Emeritus Professor of Applied Economics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research has focused on the foundations of property rights and natural resources and how these institutional arrangements impact our environment. He earned his doctorate in natural resource economics in 1969 at Oregon State University. Since his retirement in 2009, he has been a visiting professor at Humboldt University in Berlin, Germany. Professor Bromley has also served as a consultant with the Global Environment Faculty or Facility, the World Bank, the Ford Foundation, and other government agencies and foundations. He continues to serve as editor of the journal Land Economics. Professor Bromley is now working on a book to be titled World Disorder, Possessive Individualism, and the Crisis of Capitalism. He provides the evidence that financialization of the global economy is the reason we are experiencing the crisis. Professor Bromley, Marty, welcome to Smart Talk. Let me open this discussion with a request, Professor Bromley, that you explain to the listeners what you mean by possessive individualism and how this relates to the process of financialization about which there is widespread concern. Possessive individualism is a term that was uh, coined by the Canadian philosopher C.B. McPherson to describe our, uh, shall we say, the, the perception that we have as individuals that we are the sole proprietors of our capacities and of our uh, abilities to uh, navigate our way through life. So possessive individualism is basically what we got from the Enlightenment. It is individualism. Uh, it is the capacity to move through market processes as an accumulating, maximizing, self-centered individual. And uh, the market process allows for the full manifestation of this individualistic possessive tendency that we see in late stage capitalism. That's possessive individualism. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, to what extent, Marty, do the same dynamics operate to influence the work in which you are engaged regarding uh, public infrastructure development and management? As someone who has closely studied Henry George's analysis of political economy, do you see additional causal factors at work? Yeah, I think it's uh, interesting, the concept of financialization. When you consider what's uh, involved in, in that process, it's, uh, uh, it's taking away from any uh, social wealth that might be created. Uh, in financialization, there's additional factors, additional uh, money being made, so to speak, uh, you know, away from any consideration that might cause a an efficient market, uh, there's you know just additional costs involved. So, in the in the when I'm where I'm studying on infrastructure, uh, I'm stressing the 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 importance of capturing the land values, for example, and, and putting that back into the infrastructure systems that uh, society needs. Well, since. Since the 2008 crash, mainstream economics has been criticized as detached from how the world actually works. Those of us who have studied the political economy of Henry George argue that the most serious analytical problem is caused by the assertion that nature, that is land, 
response to the price mechanism in the same way as capital goods. Professor Bromley, in your paper on the Arab Spring, you refer to capital in the form of land. Is it your contention that land is a capital good? It's my contention that land is an asset. Uh, I say that there's no such thing as land. There's only land tenure. So I like to put the emphasis on the, the institutional arrangements that define for us what land is, who owns it, who controls it, what have you, how it's taxed. So uh, there's a long debate in economics about what capital is or is not. I, I, you're right. I probably use that terminology. Maybe I was sloppy. Maybe I wasn't paying uh, close enough attention to how one ought to think about it. Uh, land is an asset. Uh, it is fixed in place. We know this. It has different institutional arrangements put on top of it, which uh, enable different kinds of income streams to arise from it. Uh, I guess I wouldn't want to push too hard whether it is or is not capital. It is an asset that gives rise to various income streams, depending on how we decide to uh, assign rights to it, obligations, what have you. So maybe I should stop there and see if I've helped or made it worse. When you're, have I answered the question or not? Well, I, I think I'll uh, let Marty respond uh, to whether okay. you ha have adequately answered the question. Yeah, that, that's good. I uh, think that I guess I want to point out is that in the uh, the Henry George approach that we take here at the school, uh, we're always looking for the the, the opportunity to, to fund things that are you know public services, infrastructure services, and uh, if you uh, know the history of the. Henry George movement and the the first taxers of the of the early tens and twenties of the last century, uh, you know that there is a uh, an argument made that uh, the neoclassical movement, in fact, was uh, uh, was uh, created, so to speak, to counter any influence that uh, Henry George would have, because he'd had a, a very strong emphasis on the nature of land as a third factor of production. And anybody who's uh, familiar with neoclassical economics, the dominant uh, science that we have in schools today, uh, they lack that appreciation of the land as a factor of production. So it, uh, it's very critical to our analysis that land be a, a separate factor. Uh, and once you identify it not as a uh, well, once you identify it as a factor of production, then these things such as environmental externalities go out the window because environmental things that would be adverse to the environment are within the economic system. And that's, that's the factor I think Henry George would, would take in that analysis. Can I follow well, up on that, Ed? Can I sure, please do. That? No, I, I fully agree. I, uh, land is a fic to me, land is a fictitious commodity. Karl Polanyi identified labor as a fictitious commodity. I say land is a fictitious commodity. Marty talked about it in terms of being folded into neoclassical economics. I fully agree with that. Uh, Richard T. Ely, who founded the journal that I still edit, uh, Ely insisted that land was a public trust. And I think that's probably pretty close to what Henry George had in mind. Uh, a private firm is a public trust, land is a public trust, by which I mean these are assets that are uh, in, inadequately commoditized in the way uh, contemporary economics deals with them. So uh, land to me is a fictitious commodity, it's been commoditized to allow it to be folded into the, the sort of mainstream economics that Marty was talking about. And I think that would be quite sympathetic to a Georgist position. Well, certainly a key to what Henry George was writing about is the nature of property rights. Yep. And when we consider the nature of property rights, in my experience anyway, rarely is there any effort by analysts or commentators to distinguish between land and what we construct on land, on locations. If you take residential property, for example, all one ever hears about is housing. Uh, to what extent does this make it nearly impossible for societies to objectively examine the problems caused by property rights extended to owners of land when there's no distinction made. Your thoughts on that? Property rights do not exist. Property rights are created. So my thought starts from, I think, a position of sympathy with what you asked. Uh, 
there is a the Lockean tradition made people imagine that there's something out there called property rights, which are somehow sacred and timeless and need to be discovered by the by the litigation in the courts and ultimately the Supreme Court. But uh, property rights are a variable. Uh, Darwin taught us that finchness is a variable. Uh, Kant and other philosophers have really reminded us that property rights are themselves a variable. They evolve. They must evolve. What I own depends not on what I say I own, but what on the community says that I own. And so that, in a sense, reinforces the point that, that ownership or property rights, whether it's in land or dwellings on top of land, are social constructs. They're mediated. It changes over time. So it's, it's a dynamic changing thing. Uh, and, uh, well, let me leave it at that. Does that make sense? Ed, does that? Well, I, I think it, from, from the standpoint of, of someone who has embraced Henry George's definition, it requires a lot more debate and discussion. Maybe okay. Marty would care to share his views. Yeah, I think one of the things, and I've read uh, Daniel's uh, papers on the fisheries, which is, does a very good job of uh, uh, going into the detail of this. But one of the things that I thought that was very uh, unique that uh, Daniel brings up is this idea that, that property is something that creates a benefit stream in the future. And I think that's the, the point that escapes most people, because most people think, property, oh, it's something I can trip over, I can, uh, I can put in my hands and make a ball out of it. But you're saying that it's a, uh, a benefit stream that goes into the future. And you know, of course, it also is the, you know, what other people uh, acknowledge that you, you have that, that benefit stream. So I thought maybe, Dan, if you could uh, go into that uh, detail and, and explore that. Yeah, that's right. Uh People say, well, I bought a piece of property. What they ought to say is that I bought a piece of land and it happens to have a dwelling on it. Property has become linguistically uh, confused in, in our discourse. Uh, property, uh, in a sense, is a benefit stream. It is, and, and social arrangements uh, ratify the extent of that benefit stream into the future. So what, when we talk about property rights, what we're talking about is the, the legal overlay that, that sits on top of an asset such as land. And uh, so we don't own property. What we own is an income stream into the future. And to the extent that, as, as the Georgists would argue, to the extent that a lot of that value that accrues to that, that particular uh, setting is socially constructed by infrastructure, by fortuitous circumstances of Ricardian differential value. All of those those things that seem to have monetized value attached to them, for the most part, are socially created things which, as Henry George reminded us, uh, can be taxed away without really changing at the margin how that asset is used. Property rights evolve their social constructs. Well, perhaps uh, this, this issue really is in the realm of the moral philosopher more than in the realm of the economist. Yep. Uh, and that's, you know, and moral philosophers have been debating o over the definition of justice for centuries. And we still seem, seem to be uh, pretty far away from coming up with a consensus over what just relations are and just what the rights we have to ourselves and to what we produce, and even to nature. But, but preparing for this interview, Professor Bromley, I listened to your 2012 lecture in Germany uh, titled Vulnerable People, Vulnerable States, Redefining the Development Challenge. And in that lecture, you stated the following. You said, the logic of convergence stresses economic growth as the assured means to eliminate poverty, while the logic of fighting poverty enables donors to work on a variety of programs concerning poor people. What I took from your comments is the primary beneficiaries of such programs are those who develop and implement the programs and not the poor. So I'm wondering, am I ever stating the case? Only slightly. That statement was embedded in a larger critique of uh, the donor assistance programs of the World Bank and others where 
they they talk about a world free of poverty but really what they are trying to do for the most part is to stimulate economic growth so when i say the logic of of growth or the logic of convergence is growth that's part of a long debate in the development literature that if we just provide the right kind of technical assistance the right kind of infrastructure uh, to the developing countries that their GDP will grow and ultimately there will be convergence, i.e. that the poor will become as rich as, as, as we are. Uh, that's obviously has failed. It's a bad strategy to begin with. So the bank and, and part of this statement that I made was I don't say that fighting poverty is done to benefit employees of the World Bank. What my argument was that Fighting poverty is like fighting terrorism. You never know when you've won. You never know what you're going to do. So the emphasis that these donors have on a world free of poverty, in a sense, enables donors to do almost anything they wish to do, whether they're engineers, whether they're water chemists, whether they're public health folks. It, it is an enabling agenda which often uh, has very little feedback in terms of how well we've done on it. So that's really what I meant by that statement, Ed, that it's, it's not benefiting the donors themselves who have good intentions. It is, in a sense, a carte blanche to do whatever it is the donors wish to do and justify it under the banner that they're fighting poverty. And I, that's the, the book that you mentioned, Vulnerable People, Vulnerable States. It's, uh, my argument in that book is that this is not the way to help poor countries. Perhaps it's a law of unforeseen consequences at work. That? Yeah, but it, it's also deceitful because we can, we can go in and under the banner of fighting poverty, we can do almost anything. And the record, I'm sorry to say, of, of a lot of our donor assistance, in a sense, causes as many problems as it solves. Maybe it causes more, depending if you're in a bad mood that day. You can make an argument that a lot of what we do under development assistance doesn't really help, and it may harm because it it uh, it upsets stuff. And uh, Hernando de Soto, his name hasn't come up in this conversation, but de, de Soto is one of these guys who argued that, you know, land represents dead capital out there. Here we're back to our discussion of capital. DeSoto says we need to go into Africa and issue formal titles, i.e. commoditize land to change it from dead capital into growth. And basically those programs have done more harm than good because when you do that, you rip away the social protection that exists in an African village and you give titles uh, to people if they're poor, they end up selling their land to someone, and the experience in Kenya has been that most of the land ends up in the hands of political operatives. And right. this, this, is, this is a terribly destructive thing under some sort of false idea of what land is and what capital is. Back to your very first question. I think Marty uh, has, looks like he wants to add something as well. I, I, I guess a, a, a baseball analogies are always good. You know, like if you... Uh, you bat in zero for 50, uh, you're not doing too well. So here the World Bank and other organizations are trying this uh, poverty reduction and have failed for 50 years. So it's kind of like, well, uh, what's good about uh, the picture we see? I think the, uh, the point that Dan makes in the, the book, Vulnerable People, Vulnerable States, is the promotion of the idea of uh, coherent economics. And he had uh, uh, factors involved in that. And the first two were getting the data right and then the institutional context. And what I read in there, especially when you get to the, uh, the article, well, the information about the Iraqi uh, briefing book, which was totally about the basic services that a, a nation might need to uh, get itself up. Uh, you know, that's the intersection with my concern about the infrastructure systems because uh, a big part of any society's wealth is going to be how well you supply those things that are for basic services like the shelter and food and water and those things. Uh, sometimes you just can't put a, a value on that. It's just something that you need. And those are the institutional contexts that create the markets that form the magic in uh, the economy. So, you know, one of the things that <clears throat> Dan brings up quite often is the, the context of what is the market and all the things that precede the market conditions. And uh, you'll see there's a lot of public investment 
that go into that. Yeah. Well, Marty, uh, listening to your comments there, I mean, I'm just reminded uh, that based on your work with the Asset Leadership Network, uh, one question I have that comes up to me is, will future infrastructure and other development projects proceed only when the concerns of all stakeholders are thoroughly and objective, objectively addressed, or are we going to continue to have sort of top-down decision-making uh, surrounding these kinds of development initiatives? Yeah, one of the things that I'm working on as a, a standard with the uh, American Society of Testing Materials, ASTM, um, uh, and I'm developing a standard with my subcommittee on um, it's called infrastructure management and it has a component of community engagement uh, of course you're not going to get hundred uh, percent agreement or consensus on what to do but considering that uh, the public or the service recipients aren't being uh, asked at all today just having uh, voices heard is a big step forward. And uh, the way that the standard is set up is that uh, a grade is given from the, the, the executive of the city, let's say a mayor or somebody, but uh, also uh, the person using this guide might be a military base commander or it could be, for example, a Shell Oil Company in Nigeria maybe they provide uh, goods and services to the, the neighbor. So there's a variety of people who could be the executive using this standard, but the idea is that you, you honestly grade what you're doing and then you get input from people and they say, oh, you're not doing it or you are doing it. But uh, in the final analysis, it's not important what the grade is. It's what you plan to do for the next period, the next year, and if you want to have better services, it's like, okay, where are the resources going to come from for that betterment? And I think that's the communication that's going to occur. And I think it's always healthy when you have an open debate about what's happening, where the money coming from. Oh, have you thought about land value capture, for example? This might be the first opportunity that certain cities might have to say, huh, I wonder how that works. So. That's the, the ideas that I have behind that. Dan, did you want to uh, comment on anything that Marty put on the table? That's, that's good. I mean, infrastructure, I, I think Marty's talking about physical infrastructure, but I think those of us who work in developing countries often fail to appreciate the lack of social infrastructure, which might be called good governance, good processes, what have you, and uh, we need both kinds of infrastructures. I mean, a, a viable economy requires not only the physical infrastructure that Marty was just talking about, but the social infrastructure, the rules of the, the rules by which people will engage each other in the market uh, to assure both efficiency and equity, what have you. So that there's a social infrastructure out there that we that we also need to pay attention to. And that, in a sense, could be called governance, it could be called uh, participatory government, what have you, accountability, transparency. That's the social infrastructure that also matters a great deal. And it's usually missing, uh, seriously missing. Um, your comments bring to mind this question. In my own professional background, which was real estate finance, uh, we, we really came to what we thought were best practices that we would put forward whenever we uh, engage in this kind of discussion with various stakeholders. Is there, to use your word, a convergence on what are the best practices for developmental projects? There are design standards, as just from your, you know, from the, the world that you and Marty come from. We have design standards, we have performance standards. Uh, I would say they're not very well adhered to in the developing world. We have uh, an exercise that the World Bank participates in. They call it a country policy and institutional assessment exercise where they try to assign scores to a whole range of, of attributes, 16 different attributes in these developing economies. And for the most part, the, the record and the performance of these things is really quite bad. And, and that, again, is sort of where, it seems to me, those of us who work on these developing 
country problems, we need to give more attention to that those best practices, as you call them, uh, because they're usually ignored, Ed, usually ignored. Is that your experience as well, Marty? Um, yeah, I think one of the points I wanted to make is the the concept of use value. You know, we, we run into these concepts of uh, asset management and we got these uh, hard things that we touch and we measure and we maintain, but there's a, a value in something being utilized so that it improves lives and improves education, kind of like the, the ideas that Dan was talking about, the social infrastructure. Uh, I think once we get into that communication, that engagement, and we start critically evaluating the, the use value of what's being provided, I think we, we advance as a society. Well, uh, this... This brings up uh, another another reading I did uh, to prepare for our, our interview and discussion, uh, Dan, is the paper that you wrote titled uh, Volitional Pragmatism, the Collective Construction of Rules to Live By. And we're kind of moving to that area with the last bit of our discussion. Um, you know, Marty and I and others who have taught political economy of Henry George would would really uh, focus on these rules to live by, you know, trying to, we're trying to search for the path to a just society. So in, you ask in this paper, the question you say, can economics be rescued from the epistemological dead end it has created for itself? Uh, and this question seems to be closely related to your later observation that, quote, what some are pleased to call the market is simply the constructed artifact of prior collective action. So I guess my question is, is mainstream economics so wedded to the theories of long dead economists that objective analysis is subverted? No, it's not a prisoner to long dead economists. It's a prisoner to currently living people who fail to understand that, uh, that an economy is a dynamic, organi uh, organic, ongoing process. And uh, so it's, it, they're not all dead. They're still alive and still contributing to some of the mischief that, in a sense, gets in the way. And by, what, by, by getting in the way, what I mean is that economics does not have an evolutionary theory. We do not understand how economies become. One of the things I always say is that an economy is always in the process of becoming. New problems arise, new scarcities emerge. Uh, we learn new things, and economics does not have a, 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 a coherent theory of economic change. And so that's, in a sense, where I think we're trapped, uh, and that's where, until we can figure out how to think through this becoming process, we will, in a sense, I think, be stuck uh, where we are. Thorsten Veblen in 1898 had a great paper about why economics is not an evolutionary science, and it, it, it still is not. And, and I, that's my argument, Ed. That's where the, the serious problem lies. And it's, it's a product, I think we're making progress, it's a product of sort of the rational maximizing, uh, rational person model that is now, given the recent recognition of Richard Taylor and is the Nobel Prize, Economics is coming to grips with the fact that we do not know why people act the way they do. And once we could finally all admit that, then I think it will liberate economics to sort of take seriously the need to understand dynamic change in an economy, which we do not do very well now at all. Does that make sense? Do you, am I responding to you there? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, Marty probably gets this in the classroom as I do. Uh, many, many of our students simply have given up trying to understand the economy. Yes. Uh, they, no. they just don't really see how it comes together. And we have so many conflicting views coming to us from the media uh, and from commentators. And often what we hear them say has such uh, a disconnect with everyday reality. I have great sympathy for students because you know what? We don't teach students about the economy, okay? 
We do not teach them that. We teach them about the utility maximizing consumer. You look, you open up a textbook, yeah. whether it's for sophomores or, or masters or PhD students, the, the first chapter is the, the individual as a consumer and how the consumer allocates limited income to maximize utility across a bundle of choices that are available to her. That's not about the economy. That's about some isolated hedonistic maximizer trying to allocate her limited budget between wheat and, and beer and cheese and, and cell phones. That's not about the economy. And then macroeconomics is not about the economy. So it is no wonder that students have no idea how the economy works because economics doesn't teach us that. We teach how individuals maximize and we teach how central banks set interest rates and, and blah, blah, blah. That is not anything about how the economy works. No wonder they're puzzled. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that uh, the very well stated, and I think one of the uh, things that uh, Dan does very well in the same paper of volitional um, uh, uh, pragmatism was the idea that uh, economics is not a science of choice, uh, but rather a science of the consequences. And uh, I think that is a, a good way of uh, describing the, where we are today in the science of economics. And it kind of goes back to that point that I made about when neoclassical economics was created, it created the mess that we're in, and you reflect on what people were thinking about during that time when we made that transition. And you know, Henry George's ideas were you know, pretty prominent in the society. So uh, neoclassical economics has done a good job of stirring the brains of, uh, of a lot of people. And I think Dan does a real good job, and I, I got, I, I've mentioned this before, but the, the paper on the marine policy uh, does an excellent job on rights, property rights, and, and property. And I, I would encourage uh, people watching this video to go to Dan's uh, website and uh, read up on those. And I'd just like to add one little thing, if I may, to this. Sure, uh, please do. That, uh, you know, the 2008 crisis, the financial crisis that started actually in the fall of 2007, uh, there was a lot of sort of disbelief because with, in economics we have this idea of efficient markets and self-correcting stuff and a lot of uh, a lot of people who believe that sort of sat back and said well a crisis like this can't happen because all markets are efficient and so on so to, to this goes back to my point that we really do not have a theory about how the economy works because we're we're so embedded in the idea that markets are efficient that there'll be self-correction the minute something shows up that doesn't seem right. And if, if anything, the crisis of 2008 and 9 showed us that the, this fiction of efficient markets is, is dangerous and can do great harm if, if not watched out for. And that was, that's where economics came under justified criticism. Uh, Sometimes it, it sounds like we, we give ourselves too much credit that we, that we know really what's going on and, gee, we were caught by surprise. I, I think the problem is that still there's too much belief in efficient markets and self-correction and, and so therefore crises like happened in 2008 can't really happen. Well, ask people who lost their home, ask 7 million people who lost their home in that crisis if crises happen. They'll give you an answer, won't they? Well, uh, we've, we've heard that a lot. I hear it a lot in my teaching, and I've written a lot about the property market crash. And even the professionals don't really understand uh, what drove it. Uh, I, I guess the two economists that, that seem to have center stage in challenging uh, the conventional wisdom these days that I hear most of, one is uh, Richard Wolff. And the other might be Joseph Stiglitz. And uh, I wonder if you share most of their uh, views. Of course, I have my own. I have my own test. I saw the financial crisis coming in about 2006, 2007. I call it my school teacher test. So in the summer of 2006, uh, you know, you go to parties, you run into folks, and you meet people you don't know, and you get introduced to somebody, and he's a high school teacher, and I say, "Oh, what do you do in the summers?" You know what the answer I got? I flip houses. 
I knew in 2006 and 2007 when high school teachers and even grade school teachers on their salary were flipping houses, I said to my wife, we better be careful. There's something going on here. All right. These are people buying and selling houses who don't know very much about buying and selling houses. And yet they were in the middle of this housing bubble two years before it happened. So I knew right then that's my school teacher test, Ed. You need to talk to more school teachers and ask them what they're doing in the summer. <laughs> well, um, I wonder whether your examination of the causes of the Arab Spring uh, suggests to you that, that paternalistic societal structures eventually run their course. Uh, one observation you make seems to point in that direction. You write, individuals with a college degree are not exactly charmed by gifted jobs in the darker corners of obscure obscure government bureaucracies. You like that line, do you? Yeah. I, I loved it. <laughs> uh, the paternalism, in a sense, is a symptom. I mean, to me, the work I did in Iraq, the work I've done in the Middle East, uh, the, the paternalism and the, and the sort of authoritarian rule uh, fed by our petrodollars, by the way, is a symptom of what's really missing. And, and so my argument is that in the Middle East, in many of these African countries, what's really missing is a, is, a, is a coherent economic opportunity for young people to find employment in, in meaningful ways. And I have, just like I have a school teacher model of, of the housing crisis, I have a, a model of civil uh, unrest, and that is you show me uh, the proportion of 19 to 25-year-old men who don't have a job, and I'll show you a, a society that's undergoing civil conflict now or will within the next week. So in a sense, the civil unrest that we observed in the Middle East, uh, it's somewhat related to paternalism, but paternalism is the symptom of the absence of meaningful livelihood prospects for young people. And the point I made in that paper, Ed, is that, that young men who cannot get a wife, who have no because they don't have a job, so they can't get a wife in those societies. Uh, the level of frustration, if you can imagine, the, the level of alienation uh, escalates to the point where the Arab Spring was totally predictable. Underlying economic causes, which then paternalism was trying to cover up with these gifted jobs in these ministries, and uh, finally the young people said, thanks a lot, but this is not a meaningful life for me. And that's when they took to the streets. Marty, do you see any of those dynamics in well, our own I guess society? I'm reflecting on the uh, description that uh, Daniel has given, and it kind of reminded me of the uh, the problem in uh, development economics, the the idea that uh, um, that these societies should follow the the Washington Consensus, which we described as failed, and um, also reflecting on uh, the writings of Eric uh, Reinert, who talks about historically how societies uh, form and uh, prosper. And uh, in the class I just taught on uh, land value capture, I, I, I throw out, okay, what happened in 1485? Well, that's when uh, uh, Henry VII uh, developed uh, the, the, the model for uh, England becoming strong and powerful. Uh, so that's the, the model that we should be uh, promoting to the underdeveloped countries in the Middle East and Africa. You know, look at how uh, England and Germany and the other nations, the United States, how we, we got to be where we are. And that might be a, a good uh, model to, uh, you know, where you, you try to in, you know, promote increasing returns and, and manufacturing and intellectual development. Uh, I think. That, there are things out there you can grab onto and say, hey, this worked, uh, why not here? I, I see, you ask uh, Marty, did he see things here that, that sort of mirror what I described in the Middle East? And I, uh, my answer is absolutely. If you want to understand the Trump election, you need to focus on alienation. You need to focus on, on anger. You need to focus on resentment. You need to focus on the very same things that drove the Arab Spring revolts in 2010 and 2011. I'm not saying we're going to have an Arab Spring here or an American Spring, but this 
the the failure of, of a market economy to provide opportunities for meaningful livelihoods is a profound irritant in 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 young people and in their parents who see their children unable to achieve what it, what it was people our generation where people without a college degree could get a proper job and they could send their children to college and they would know that those kids are going to be better off than they themselves were. And that's now gone. And it's been gone for about 20 years in this country. And it's finally bubbled up. So I do see some parallels between what we observed in the Middle East in 2010, 2011, and what we saw starting here during the 2008, 2009 recession. One sort of anecdotal statistic, uh, it's a couple years old, but a report by HUD uh, noted that about 50% of all college graduates under the age of 30 were living at home with parents. Precisely. And Why is that? Okay, that is precisely a symptom of something that really is, is deep and it's very frustrating to both the young people and their parents who see that the opportunities they had aren't available to their children. Right. Well, 50%, 50% of young people are living with their parents. That was the number, yes, the percentage. And we now, want, a few of them might be, you know, 20 something males who just don't want to leave home because their mother makes their meals and cook and yes. does their laundry. Of course, but I think there, there are legitimate reasons good. for that. That's right. And, and, <laughs> and, in one sense, gosh, that's really nice that, you know, the, this extended family, these multiple generations in one home, but there's a, there's an underside to that as well, which is young people are trapped at home. Uh, they're there for a reason. I would imagine many of them would like to start their own family, their own, right? And it's unavailable to them. There is a source of enormous agitation in this country right there. Well, perhaps, uh, Dan, your most controversial statement in this paper was when you wrote the following. You said, there is no such thing as human nature. There is only human history. Uh, I think I understand what you mean, but would you please elaborate on this for our listeners? Yeah, this, this statement is... I know I pull a lot of your statements out of context. No, but, that's great. But I'm, uh, it's just, you know, they, they're, they're so well written and, and they stimulate uh, a lot of thought. I specialize in provocation, Ed. Uh, the, the, point I, the point I tried to make was that uh, we don't come out of the womb with a personality that's shaped. We don't come out of the womb angry. We don't come out of the womb with any of that stuff. It's all accumulated. It's all acquired. So the thing I like to, to say is that Squirrels collect nuts. That's what squirrels do. Now, if you want to focus on the nature of squirrels, then what you say is right. That's what squirrels do. Squirrels don't calculate whether they need more nuts for the winter. They just do it every day. Humans are not that way. So I sort of say there's no such thing as human nature. Uh, there are we are the product of our socialization and of the, of the things that have buffeted us as we as we enter the world and try to make our way through it. So I, I was doing this because it was trying to, it was an effort to take on the idea that there's something wrong with the Arab or there's something wrong with the Middle Easterner uh, or there's something wrong with Islam. I mean, this was embedded in a paper that said, do not tell me that the troubles in the Middle East have anything to do with religion. Don't talk to me about human nature and the unruly Arab or the cantankerous jihadist people become who they are by virtue of the their embeddedness in a society that works or does not work for their benefit so that's why i said let's get away from this talk about there's something inherent in the arab that leads him to be violent and let's try to focus on the conditions that lead those people to rebel against their oppressive governments well, Marty, how would Henry George re respond, do you think? Because I'd have to think about that a little bit. I, I think, uh, you know, Henry, Henry George, you know, we have to remember, you know, like 120 years ago uh, in the, uh, the society that he grew up with. And, uh, you know, 
if you go back in that period of time, there was like uh, a lot of a lot of technological development. There was a lot of uh, a lot of uh, monopolies being created. There's a lot of parallels with what's going on today. But uh, I think there was a a lot of good naturedness uh, back then, and I think we we might have lost that in today's society. But I think as we have more of these kind of discussions and we start talking about what we could have uh, following the, the idea that uh, Dan just talked about, I think we can move this society. You know, once we, once we uh, answer some of those questions about uh, why doesn't economics make sense? Well, if they watch the, enough of these smart talks, I think maybe they'll start to see that the, there might be a, uh, a pathway or something to hold on to. Well, we're, we're here to offer some alternative views on how the world works. I, I recall one of the most important, <coughs> excuse me, uh, observations that, that George made about human behavior. He wrote that we uh, have a strong tendency to attempt to satisfy our desires with the least exertion. And as a result, we will try to monopolize natural opportunities. And I think this is well supported by human history. And perhaps that is part of our nature, uh, a strong part of our nature that civilization has attempted to overcome, but, but we haven't been able to do it even in the most civilized of societies. I've had some debates with people about, you know, this human nature thing. I, to me, the... The fundamental human need, to me, is what to believe. Okay, everybody's surprised because they think the fundamental human need is to be well fed and dry and warm. I, we are humans are social animals, so to me, the most, the, the fundamental human need is to figure out what we believe as a community together, because nobody lives alone on an island. And so I think the troubles that we see, the, the, the monopolization, the, the playing out of greed, I regard those as learned behaviors, Ed, and I regard them as the outcome of a set of social arrangements that reward that kind of behavior. And one of the points I'm trying to make in this book that I'm now just finishing off about world disorder is that this possessive individualism has gotten out of control, that the, that the market economy has rewarded too few people, we talk about them as the 1%, what have you, and that the vast majority of people are sort of left feeling like they've missed the train or they're angry about where they are. And I think all of that stuff is learned behavior. And that if it's learned behavior, then to me it can be unlearned, it can be overcome if we organize accordingly to, uh, to, to, to counter that kind of behavior. So that's my, my thought about yeah, and, it. And my take on that is that... Uh, uh, you know, you have to believe that there's going to be a future. So if you can believe it, you can plan for it, and uh, then you say, okay, this is a good place to, to have That's those right. goods. That's right. Well, Marty, you've, you've come to something very similar, a conclusion in your recent paper titled Resilient Govern Governance. And uh, you say that modern society is plagued by non-resilient governance for lack of of one or more of the following traits, ethics, morality, collective choice, transparency, accountability, and sustainability. So in what way is the absence of these factors associated with the laws that secure and protect property rights specifically uh, well, to nature? Take those uh, points, uh, you know, a few of them. Uh, the point that I was making in the, the talk that I gave in uh, New Orleans on resilient governance was I, I was selling the <clears throat> the idea that the standard the ASTM standard on uh, infrastructure management was essentially a tool and uh, resilience has to do with having tools to lead you toward uh, something that's sustainable and the points I was trying to make was what do you need to have uh, a resilient uh, community and you know the idea of of ethics, uh, you know, you can have unethical laws, and the law still has to be uh, um, you know, abided by because there's somebody going to arrest you. I mean, we can go back in time of all the things that were illegal, uh, including uh, you know, Jim Crow laws and such. 
so that's an example of uh, you need to go beyond just what the law is. And then in the idea about uh, morality, uh, you know, people can by law be uh, protected for being immoral, but you're not going to uh, uh, elect, for example, somebody who's immoral to represent, you know, very many people. Uh, the idea of well, collect, I would hope not. Uh, yeah. So you know, uh, we we saw examples of of that, but but then in the the idea of collective choice, that was something that Eleanor Ostrom talked a lot about. Is when you collectively manage things, uh, it's important to have a, a collective uh, approach, a collective choice. What is it we're going to do? How we're going to maintain the institutional arrangements and such. Uh, those are really the the points I was trying to make, but the the talk really had to do with was uh, this arrangement with infrastructure management. It's a, a, a tool for resiliency, and that, that's uh, the point I was trying to make. Dan, did you would you do you have any uh, further thoughts on what Marty has added? Yeah, I like that. I uh, I'll say two things. I I've spent a lot of time thinking about resilience. I absolutely agree with Marty in terms of resilience, the importance of it. I've sort of come to the idea of robustness. I spent a lot of time, the developing world, they're all talking about resilience to climate change. And my work in, in, in climate change said, yeah, resilience is fine, but I'd rather have robustness. And the, the distinction I make here is, think about a schoolyard where there's bullying that takes place among young people. So we, we teach our children to be resilient against bullying, as pick yourself up off the ground, you've been bullied. Bullies leave robust children alone. So I've kind of come to the idea that I much prefer robustness because a child who's self-confident, what have you, is not susceptible to, to being bullied. So I, but it's, it's a matter of degree, resilience, robustness. I totally agree with what Marty is, is talking about there. I'd like to offer one idea which I think fits in with this ethics and sort of the, the economy, uh, the becoming aspect. And I want to call attention to one of my favorite philosophers, Richard Rorty, who said that moral progress is not getting in touch with our ethical obligations. Moral progress is becoming increasingly sensitive to the interests of others. And I find that a very nice kind of ongoing dynamic idea that there's no moral authority out there that tells us what's the right thing to do that everybody's going to agree with. But the idea of increasing sensitivity to the interests of others, I find that quite a charming idea of moral progress. It makes us open to new ideas, open to other people. And if you look at the struggles that we have in the world, most of them arise because people are insufficiently sensitive to the interests of others, right? It is expanding the moral community beyond myself, my family, to others. Yeah, it seems that those considerations have a lot to do with where you are, uh, where you stand, and how secure your own life might be, right. and and what threats you see on a daily basis. Absolutely, uh, Marty. You know, do you? Do you have any uh, exactly on that what as well? uh, Dan was talking about was what happened after the Thirty Years' War in uh, in the Germany area. Uh, the the law of the Westphalian uh, concept is uh, the benefit of the other. That's uh, how Germany became or began its uh, rise out of uh, all that. I think there was seventy percent of the population was uh, killed, and they ended up nobody was winning. <laughs> so they said, well, let's try something different. Let's uh, look at the benefit of the other. And that's the, the concept that maybe we need to look at uh, today. And well, I think it's related, Ed, if I may, I think it's related to our current struggles. I mean, the anti-immigration, all of this struggling and fighting this ugliness that we have, to me, that is a symptom of this underlying economic insecurity that people feel. My view is that if the economy were humming along and everybody had a decent job and everybody was satisfied with their home life, immigrants would not be an issue at all. So it seems to me that what we observe, this animosity out there against the other, is a symptom of some underlying concerns and, and, and frustrations over people's material 
existence and material prospects. Can I take it then that you would agree with Henry George that we can in fact have a full employment society if we only organize ourselves in the right way? Absolutely, of course we could. The problem is that most of the people who, who own and control capital cannot seem to get rid of workers fast enough. I mean, look at the interest in automation, look at the interest in outsourcing, look at the interest in moving jobs offshore to China, what have you. So yeah, we could have, we could have a very dynamic, inclusive economy, but the people who are making the decisions, the owners of capital, have decided the one thing they really would like to do would be to get rid of having to deal with inconvenient labor. Raises many potential policy discussions. Okay. Marty may, may be familiar with uh, uh, an economist who's, who's in the Henry George camp, Mason Gaffney, ha made the argument that we instead of having a, uh, uh, an investment tax credit for capital investment, we ought to have an employee tax credit. The corporations, businesses would get a tax credit for every full-time person they employ. There's got change. to be something. There's got to be something to change Some the way. population because at the moment, uh, all of the incentives run against the hiring of labor. They all run against it, whether we're talking automation, tax policy, what have you. And so it's no wonder that we're in this fix right now where it seems that labor, in this, this book I'm working on, I, I make reference to the, the fox and the hedgehog. You know the story about foxes and hedgehogs? And I say yeah. the capitalist firm is like a hedgehog. It knows one big thing, and that is how to reduce costs. And as a result of that, the household these days, for the last 30 years, has been has been rendered a fox. And a fox knows many things, right? A fox can make a living doing a variety of things, but the fox has always got to be on his, on his toes, alert, looking for the next thing. So my view is we've got an economy now that is characterized by foxes and hedgehogs. And the hedgehogs know one big thing, and that's how to hold costs low, how to get rid of labor, how to keep regulations low, how to keep taxes low. And guess who's victimized by that? The household, who many people either can't find work or they're working two jobs, right? Juggling. We've turned households into foxes, and that's not a happy place to be. Foxes so, uh, aren't happy. The, uh, the neoliberal uh, agenda uh, that we talk about sometimes uh, I look at it as uh, rather than the two factors of production that we have with the neoclassical economics is getting down to a single factor of production, which is capital that, you know, you talk about human capital and this capital, that capital. And uh, Dan was uh, right. It was that it's just uh, how do you put everything into one thing so that you can say uh, what's efficient? Well, efficient is zero labor. You have cars that don't have anybody in them. Uh, yeah, it's just this uh, crazy mindset rather than what do we need to be happy and what does it take to get there? So that, that's really the, the thing that I just wanted to maybe end up on is on a, a good note of who, um, you know, who, who do we oppose and who are our allies and how do we get to that next point? We certainly agree, Marty, that the three factors of production treated the way Henry George treated them provides a far superior basis for analysis than the neoclassical model, for sure. Dan, did you want to add anything before we uh, uh, complete this uh, episode of Smart Talk? Well, I, the only thing I would say is it's, it's really easy to be a pessimist. And... Uh, I guess since I spent 40 years in a classroom in front of 20-year-olds, uh, I'm an optimist, and I tried to teach young people that change only comes when problems arise, and that discouragement or problematic situations should be looked at as trigger devices for have, helping us rethink how we do things and how to fix the ship of state so that we move forward. So I, I've always believed it's really important. We can sit around and criticize and be negative, and I've spent a lot of my career sort of criticizing mainstream economics, but we all are optimistic. Humans have come through much worse situations than we're in now, 
And uh, we cannot ever lose track of, of the importance of problem solving. Uh, I take a lot of inspiration from John Dewey, who uh, said, you know, let's experiment. I mean, the thing about Dewey was uh, we let's put let's try our, put our values on trial here and see how they work out. And if it works out fine, great. If it doesn't, we go back and fix it. So one must be optimistic in this business or you'd uh, become really discouraged. We, I refuse to be discouraged. I think that's why Marty and I continue to teach as we do. That's right. That's uh, exactly right. Well, uh, I'm sure your students have benefited. Maybe some of them have been significantly impacted by what you tried to teach them. Uh, we all hope that that happens. We do, don't and we? I thank both of you uh, for joining me on this episode of Smart Talk, and maybe we'll get a chance to do this again. Good. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.